Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So typically, the diaconate collects money for the pastor's discretionary fund on the first Sunday of every month. Well, that didn't happen last Sunday, so we're doing it this Sunday. Um, anyway, this fund provides support for members and friends of First Parish who need assistance during difficult times. Please open your hearts and wallets once again for this worthwhile cause. Putting money in envelopes labeled for discretionary fund will be credited to this account. Thank you. Oh, welcome. You are the body of Christ gathered here in this place. As I've been known to say, you could have chosen to be anywhere, and you chose to be here, and I give God thanks for that. You may be sitting close to or upon a card that looks something like this. This is a very important ministry of affirmation that we send cards out to people. All you have to do is fill it out, put the name on it, if you know the address, that's good. If not, we'll track them down. Put it in the offering plate as it comes by, and we will continue a very important ministry of Christian caring through these cards. The other and last thing I want to share with you prior to our going into our worship is a word about the Stephen ministry. You've heard about it a number of times. You've seen different faces that have been here telling you about it and inviting your participation. And I simply want to add my voice of support, encouragement, and just sheer pleasure that this church is embarking on that kind of ministry. It is huge. And the thing that is going to really make it wonderful is you. You, you who are sitting there saying, oh, that's a good idea, but I could never do that. You who are sitting there saying, oh, I, I've heard of that sort of, but I don't know anything about what it really is. You, you can find out, you can talk with people. I'm looking at Carol LeMay and I'm looking at Jane. Um, if you can just raise your hands. There may be some others I don't see right now, but those two people will answer any question you have regarding Stephen ministry. So please seek them out. This is a pivotal thing in the history of our church, and I really invite your participation to make it all of what it can be. So for you who are gathered here in these walls, for you who are gathered at our web community through our live streaming, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I invite you, as you are able, to please stand with me that we might share our voices in the call to worship found in your bulletin. To worship is to listen for the ancient song of creation and to recognize within that song our individual songs. To worship is to share these melodies and dissonances of our human condition. Our voices vary, some warble, some bellow, but the song is universal. It is our ode to God and to the spirit within us let us join our hearts and voices and worship God.
friends, you sounded good. Please be seated. And before, just before we move into our unison prayer of invocation, somebody after the service, please help me understand that very first verse that talks about granting us wisdom and courage for the facing of this hour. <laughs> Is it really that bad? Is it that difficult? God. Great hymn. I invite your voices to share with me the unison prayer of invocation found in our bulletin. Let us say together, one heart, soul, and voice. Spirit of holiness and life, be within our community this hour as we worship you. Search within each of us for the size beyond our words and make them articulate in our living so that we may share our hopes and fears and bring out of our deep silence your life-changing power for ourselves and for all of your creation. Amen. And as there are some church school students amongst us today, I invite you, please, come down here and let's have a chat. you, Rick. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, now, I did a quick scan out there, and I know there's more, but we won't pick on them, because you folks are the brave ones, and this is good. Thank you for being here. Have you ever, now, some of you have a longer life than others, but have you ever said something, and it was out of your mouth, and as soon as it was out of your mouth, you went, oh, oh, I probably shouldn't have said that. You know, it's out of your mouth and all you want to do is go, you know. There are times when my mom used to tell me, you know, you should probably tape up your mouth. Now, I can't remember exactly what I might have said, but it was, it was displeasing for her. So I got this masking tape. And, and it, it occurs to me that she was probably right. That when, when, when I say things sometimes, and I, I try not to be unkind, but there are some times when something comes out of my mouth and all I really want to do <laughs> is do that. Because it would be much better if I just simply spit and put it on, in an uncoat out and hurt somebody. Oh! Mustaches are tough that way. <laughs> but when, when, you're th when, when you're about to say something, please remember, words are really powerful. Words can bless and make people feel good, and words can hurt and make people feel bad. We, this church, and I'm sure you, almost all the time, want to be able to share words that feel good lifting, encouraging, cheering, okay? So, remember, <laughs> if you want, remember that sometimes taping your mouth is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And that God wants us to share words of goodness, love, all right? Okay, thank you so very much. Off to your class at this time.
Good morning. The scripture reading for today is Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. These are found on pages, uh, page 62 in the New Testament section of the Pew Bible, if you wish to follow along. I am reading from a version of the New International Bible, so some of the wording may not be exactly the same as what you're reading. This is an interesting parable. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. It has a number of players involved in it. It has a priest, whom we're fairly familiar with thinking about as a church leader, a Levite. The Levites were favored uh, members of the Jewish society. They were involved in the churches, much like our diaconate or church council is, and a Samaritan. The interesting part is the Samaritans were seen as very lax. They were looked down upon by the Jewish society. Uh, the scripture reads as follows. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? The law expert answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the law expert wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus again, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him for dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed on the other side also. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers, Jesus asked. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Here ends the reading of the scripture. Well, I think we've all done it before. At least you probably learned to count this way. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. And the sense of what a second is. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. Do you know that you can now hear ads on TV and radio that are shorter than that? In fact, you probably already have, if you are a radio listener, Clear Channel Communications, which has the largest number of stations around the country, 1,100 of them, offers time slots for advertisements as short as one second. As a last resort, or at least as I was able to do the research, no advertiser has bitten on that time slot, as minuscule as it is, but they are buying two second and five second time slots. And that is a big change because, as you know, most of us know traditionally 60 second, 30 second slots are what's more typical. The five second slot is being called an adlet. It's an adlet. And the two second spot has been dubbed a blink. But what, what can you possibly convey and communicate in tiny time periods like that? 
Well, actually, quite a bit. Here, for example, is a two-second ad you might have heard if you were listening to any of the Clear Channel stations. The Simpsons, don't, tonight on Fox. And here's a five-second ad you may have heard several seasons ago on television. I'm hearing people's thoughts. Heroes on NBC. Five seconds, two seconds, an adlet and a blink. The regional president of sales for Clear Channel conceded that the one second slot is not a whole lot to say. You can't say a lot in that, but one and a half seconds, well, that's a whole different story. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. Two of the most important messages in all of the Bible can also be stated in a five-second adlet and a two-second blink. Consider this one from the Gospel reading. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Five seconds flat, adlet, length. Or this one from the same reading. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Two seconds. A mere blink. Can you communicate anything of great meaning in an adlet or a blink? Well, elsewhere in the gospel, Jesus said about these two statements, there is no other commandment greater than these. And in a parallel version of this conversation, Jesus said, on these two commandments, Hang all the law and all the prophets. The law and the prophets. That's pretty much the whole Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture. So Jesus is saying that without these two commandments, which can be summed up in statements as short as one adlet and one blink, well over three quarters of the entire Hebrew Scripture would not exist. What's more? If we read the New Testament with these two commandments in mind, we quickly see that most of the New Testament, the Christian scripture, wouldn't make much sense without them. So, in the Gospel reading that Jack just shared with you, these two commandments come from the lips of a lawyer of all people. Notice that the translation Jack did not say lawyer. I don't know, maybe they did some editing there. A lawyer who had asked Jesus what he, what he needed to do, what the, did the lawyer, the person responsible for the law of the land, what did he need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responded by asking him a question. Great rabbinic thing. Somebody asks you a question, you ask a question back. What is written in the law? And to that question, to his credit, the lawyer recited this adlet and blink summary of the law. Jesus gets it. He says, that was right answer. Do this, and you will live. Trouble was, the lawyer, who had no trouble remembering the advertiser's adlet and blink version of the law, had forgotten the even shorter admonition from the law that Jesus stated. Do this. That's not even one one thousand. Right? It's not even one second long, but the lawyer's next question to Jesus is a dead giveaway that he had skipped the internalizing part of that message, part of that law, because he still had to ask, who is my neighbor? Now, it's all too easy to point out the shortcomings of the lawyer. In fact, even Luke can't help himself. But wanting to justify himself, Luke writes, yielding to that temptation, though, is not helpful because the fact of the matter is nobody wants to identify with the lawyer in this incident. We divorce ourselves pretty quickly from identifying too closely with his perspective. But come on, let's give him some credit. He at least had some sense that though the law could be stated in an adlet or a blink, it was asking for a significant 
commitment. Consider that in the first command, the one about loving God. The Greek word rendered love in English is agape, being translated as self-giving, even sacrificial compassion. And here's a question that command can generate. How do I know? I mean, really, how do I know that I am giving myself to God? Well, because I'm doing God's will. But how do I know I'm doing God's will? Well, because I'm praying, and I'm listening for God, and I'm reading my Bible. But how do I know that what I'm understanding from the scriptures and prayer is leading to behavior that is really God-loving? Well, uh, uh, because um, uh, it's at that point that the adlet, the blink, becomes really complex. And if that's not enough complexity, consider what loving God might mean in terms of each of the aspects that the law unfolds. He said we should love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And those four words are not simply four synonyms for the same thing. Oh, no, no, no. The heart, biblically speaking, and for the Hebrews particularly, is the seat of our spiritual life our innermost being. And the soul is our life, our very life itself. And that includes our feelings and desires. And our mind refers to the understanding, the capacity for intelligence, the things that we utilize to create meaning in our life and put at God's disposal. And our strength, our capacity, our power to act. All of those things being utilized to love God. So, if Jesus is saying that to love God means that we put all of those parts of ourselves at God's disposal, then this five-second statement, this adlet, is really complicated. Now consider the second command, love your neighbor as yourself. The same word for love used, agape, but here, there's no reference to our heart, our soul, our strength, our mind. Instead, there is something more specific. Yeah, we're supposed to love God with all of those four. But in this second blink, two second, we are to what? Love our neighbor. How? Who? What? As ourselves. But again, how do I know? I mean, it sounds simple. It's a blink, right? Two second. How do you do that? How do I know I'm doing that? Is that when I'm, I'm outpouring my concern for another person? Is it a higher form of self-love? Is it when I'm working for another person to have the same opportunities that I have been gifted with? Love your neighbor as yourself. It's a blink. That blink part of the road to inheriting eternal life got a real workout on the upper slopes of Mount Everest. On the morning of May 26, less than a thousand feet, considering all, less than a thousand feet from the summit, American guide Daniel Mazur abandoned his own climb toward the top of the world to save another climber who had been left for dead by his own team. Despite the fact that Mazur's decision to aid the fallen mountaineer meant that none of his group, which included two paying customers at $60,000 apiece, not any of them would make it to the summit. Mazur's action acknowledged who his neighbor was. The fallen climber was an Australian by the name of Lincoln Hall, who had succumbed to the oxygen-poor altitude the previous night, and he became desperately ill. The two guides with him tried to help, but they eventually had to leave to save themselves. Paul was effectively declared dead. But when Mazur and his team found him the next morning, he was sitting up, although he was completely disoriented. Mazur's team gave him emergency assistance, 
They radioed for help, but by the time the others arrived to take over the rescue, Mazur's group had used up and expended all of their energy at that life-sapping altitude. They couldn't go on. They couldn't complete their climb. While Mazur's team was helping haul, two Italian climbers came by, passed en route to the top. Mazur asked them to assist. The pair claimed not to understand English and kept moving. Later, their claim was proved to be false. Hall has recovered from his near-death experience on the mountain. Just 10 days before Hall was rescued, another climber froze to death near the summit, while 40 other mountaineers passed by without attempting to save him. Now, to be fair, in the world of high-altitude climbing, such behavior is often accepted, especially when the fallen person is judged to be too far gone. It's triage of the most cruel sort. But at least in that context, it's understandable. And there's always the possibility that others might die in those harsh conditions attempting to help the victim. Still, nothing in our Bible suggests that the love your neighbor as yourself blink is only a sea level commitment or any other altitude specific commitment. Note, note that Jesus was not commending a new strange set of commands, or even a new emphasis. Both of these commands come directly out of Judaism. The lawyer was quoting correctly from the Hebrew scripture. What's more, other world religions have much of the same thing to say. So our problem, I'm thinking clearly, is not one of our understanding the commands. Oh, no, no. I can't, I don't know if it's Mark Twain or, or, or who it was, I'll blame him, that said, it's not what's, what's, what's in the Bible and I don't understand it, it's, it's what I do understand that's so difficult. This is what I'm talking about. Our problem is not with understanding the commands. We know it. In 1964, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart wrote an opinion in the obscenity case about the legal difficulties in defining what is obscene and what is not. He wrote, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of materials I understand to be embraced in this suit. But I know it when I see it. We can approach Jesus' statements about these two commands that same way. Most of us don't need to spend a long time further defining those two commands because whether we can articulate them or not, we know instinctively what Jesus was talking about. Until the lawyer asked him self-justifying question, Jesus did not even elaborate on those two commands. Rather, his response to the lawyer, do this. Apparently, Jesus, too, assumed that our difficulty is not one of understanding, but one of performance. Thus, if we are to follow Jesus, and I hope we do, if we are to follow Jesus, doing these two commands is not optional. Whether it's at the Dead Sea or the Everest summit altitude, or any altitude in between. An adlet and a blink can tell us when the next episode of Heroes or The Simpsons will air. Or they can remind us of the greatest commandments that are filled with a lifetime of meaning and an eternity of reward. We, like the lawyer, need only to add one more thing. This one 1,000 action through which we will inherit eternal life. Do this. It's that simple. Do this. Amen.
into our time of prayer together this day. I'd like to share some of the prayers that have been part of my week and then invite the prayers that you have brought today. I give Carl and Joe Nancy thanks and thanks be to God for the flowers they have made possible today. They grace our sanctuary and will grace others as they go forth from here person who usually sits right in front of Christy Mateo there, um, Art Morissette, is not with us today because he is celebrating with his mother her 100th year birthday. So I give God thanks for that witness. I received an email from Vicki Cronin. Vicki Cronin reports to me and wanted me to share with you prayers of thanksgiving and, um, and hope because Bob who 10 months and four days ago uh, suffered a stroke. Tomorrow, he's going back to work. And he's a little nervous, as you might suspect. So prayers of comfort, prayers of support and encouragement, prayers of joy and thanksgiving. I've also held Don Skelton in my prayers as he continues to recover from inter heart intervention. Ian Stewart, as he journeys with cancer, he and his family. For Carol Nero's brother, Herman, who is also journeying with cancer. And I got a call yesterday that Dorothy Cook, longtime friend and member of this congregation, died yesterday in Florida, 95 years old. So this world is a little bit poor, her and her family are grieving her absence. Last night was busy. Rusty Anderson ended up going to Mass General Hospital in a ambulance and so she will be having surgical intervention and just so that you don't get too worried she's being rusty feisty she's good then finally well not finally but finally for my life anyway here in, in this past weekend today um, Pam Moline standing back there may have a certain glow about her and you may have noticed it on Bob as he greeted you coming in today but their daughter Abby got married recently and so we celebrate the joy of a marriage and, and a blessing upon Abby and Aaron. Well, okay, for the folks too. So those are the prayers that I bring today and I wonder, I wonder, I wonder about the prayers that you have. Prayers of joy and celebration, prayers of care and concern. What, what are the prayers that you have brought with you today? I'd like to ask for some prayers for um, our family as we enter into a new aspect. Uh, we will be um, putting my father, we will be helping my father to um, 
enter into assisted living, which is a dramatic emotional, mental time. And um, in a couple weeks, we will be moving my mother into the same facility, although in a different section. Right. And so they will be able to be closer to each other and visit. For the transitions that are always so difficult, for the transition into assisted living, for all of that and all of what that means, we offer our prayers of support and encouragement and God's blessing in those transitions. Britt? I'd like to offer up uh, prayers for Paul and Anne-Marie McDonough, who some folks here may know. Um, Paul is a longtime colleague and good friend of mine. Uh, Anne-Marie um, has been diagnosed with an uh, aggressive uh, stomach cancer, and she's going down to Dana-Farber uh, this week for pre-op planning. But um, anybody who knows them, uh, they, they need prayers and support right now. For and Paul and Anne-Marie, in their journey with cancer, way, way too many people making that journey. Prayers of support, prayers of encouragement, prayers of God's healing presence for them and for all. Heather, yes. I would ask for prayer for my 93-year-old mother that had a stroke and is in rehabilitation. Her first name? Fran. Fran. Fran Burgess. Thank you. I knew that and I couldn't come up with it. Prayers for Fran. The prayers of these people surrounding her now and you. Linda? I'd like to ask for prayers, two prayers. One for my friend's daughter, Diana, who was thrown off a golf cart yesterday, I guess, and fractured her skull. And then on a better note, <laughs> I'd like to ask for prayers of joy and celebration for my granddaughter's marriage that took place yesterday. I'd like to uh, ask for prayers too for my wife who is having some back problems. She's gonna need the prayers, thank you. She may need them, but she certainly has them. Prayers for you. Back pain is, is difficult. God bless you. Mac? Um, my mother is going in for eye surgery this week, and even though it's you know, a pretty routine surgery, we'd ask for prayers, and that her sight would improve, and, except when it comes to the cleanliness, seeing the cleanliness of my house. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, certainly. <laughs> That her sight might improve and her vision stay as wonderful as it is. <laughs> yes. A lot, of, a lot of different ways that medicine can intervene and become a vehicle for God's blessing and God's grace. That, that sight may be enhanced. Troy over here with Catherine, or perhaps Pam, you're closer. We don't say it often enough, but prayers for Karen and you. And I see that Kara and her husband are here today. Blessings to the whole family. Amen. Absolutely. Thank you. Jane? I'd like to ask prayers for those that don't know the presence of God. For those who are alive and doing their living and don't know, don't know the presence of God in their lives. That somehow God may speak, the God that is still speaking may speak to them in ways that they can hear. <coughs> Pam and Robert. Uh, prayers of traveling mercies for Peter Stickney who's away at, at a conference and Prayers of thanks to Terry for filling in and leading us so wonderfully and providing such beautiful music. Absolutely. This is a blessed community to have such talent to be able to be present to us. Terry, thank you. Prayers from the web community? Yes, Doug, I have several. 
One prayer from Katie Rodner, healing prayers for Megan who lost her dad, Bob, suddenly in a motorcycle accident. Katie also offers prayer of strength for Christian who, as she works through rehab. From Freddie, and I love this one, a prayer of thanks for Eric Steva who has agreed to become the new chair of the media team. And for Freddie, he also didn't know how to word this, so I took it upon myself. And he wants prayers of strength and courage as he is moving to Washington State in September. And on a personal note, Cindy Howard has not been in church for a while because she has infections in her body and is just ongoing. So I give prayer for healing to Cindy and maybe she get her strength back to be in church again. Absolutely. Thank you. My friends, in a way that makes sense to you, and I don't know what that is for you. It may be a closing of your eyes, a bowing of your head. It may be a clasping of your hands, a deepening of breath, a settling in for a posture. Whatever it is for you, I invite you to now be joined. Let us be joined in prayer. Let us pray. The sound of my call, hear, O oh Lord, and have mercy. My soul is longing for the glory of you. Hear, O oh Lord, and ask. and gracious God on a day like this oh it is easy it is easy it is easy to give you thanks as we feel the warmth of the sun and the gentle breeze it is easy to see the colors surrounding us oh it's easy and so on this day hear our thanksgiving for the way that you've been present in our lives for the way that you have brought us to this place in time for the way that you continue to show us love in a variety of ways for the faces that convey your love. Gracious God, thank you. For the journey when it is difficult. When we desperately need you to be Emmanuel. When the journey toward wholeness, health, and healing is a staggeringly difficult one. when our own lives and the people in them are estranged, bitter, scared, and angry. Gracious God, allow the sense of your reconciliation beyond our wildest dreams to be made manifest and real in our lives, where children can come close again to parents where spouses can come close again to one another, where entire families can get a sense of being united in powerful, strong ways. God, use us. Use us as instruments of your peace. Use us in our own homes. Use us in our own places of work. Use us in this place called church instruments of your peace, bringing healing and wholeness wherever we travel. And as we do so, O oh God, know that we place ourselves before you, our successes and our failures, our hopes and dreams, and even sometimes our nightmares. Gracious God, our whole living comes before you in prayer, and places our lives into your care. Hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken. Use our lives, partial or in total. And hear us now, in this place, at this time, 
as we share the words of your Son by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. By your very lives lived in the way you live them. By your very presence here today, you are the offering that we receive. And as you are want to manifest that in an outer way, with metal or pieces of paper, with a prayer, with an intention, with a vision, with a memory, when that plate goes by you, place a piece of yourself in it, knowing that you are the best offering that can be given. Let us do so with the joy of the faith at this time. Gracious God, receive these gifts in these plates, in these pews, the totality of our offering to you, used to your glory and in the name of your Son, Jesus. Let these blessings be multiplied by the power of your love. Amen. Now, my friends, you have a surprise, and you don't even know it yet. 
in the bulletin, it says you're going to turn and sing hymn 70. But that's not true. That's not true. There are times when certain people who are standing in front of you make a mistake, and I'm in one of those people at this time. It's actually 79. But that's not the surprise. Because <laughs> I've made mistakes before. But the surprise is, is that we're going to sing this in a round. So hymn number 79, Terry is going to do a melody dominant playing right now so that we can firmly locate it in our ears. And then this section will be section one. <laughs> And I'll get there. This section will be section two. And this section and the balcony will be number three. Now, you're all looking at that hymn. You see where it says one, two, and three, right? So we're going to do this in a round. Terry's going to, um, going to have us hear the melody. And then we're going to do it three times, starting here. OK? All right. So listen. Listen. Okay, let's let's all do that once. All, you know, all those three. Let's do it just once all together. Love God with your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Love God with your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Love God with your strength and your neighbor as yourself. That's excellent. Shall we? God with your heart and your neighbor Love God with your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Love God with your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Love God with your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Love God with your heart. as I was afraid it was going to be. Not only that, but it was much better than I thought. It was wonderful. Thank you for your voices. Let the worship end and the service, just like you sang, begin. Go in peace. <laughs>